in this video I'd like to tell you about bats. We've got 17 species in the UK and 9 in Scotland. But in this video I'll keep it short and just focus on four which represent the four main foraging techniques which are trawling, aerial hawking, gleaning and passive listening. I'll also mention a few cool adaptations and their co-evolution with moths. We all know that bats use echolocation to find their prey by sending out calls that bounce off an insect or an object that will then help the bat determine where that insect or object is. Specifically, they've got a really well-developed feature which is called the tragus. We've got this too, it's this little sticky outfit here in your ear. They've got it much more developed in bats. It's the returning echo um, bouncing off an insect or object will go directly in the ear and will also bounce off that tragus. The interval between the direct echo and the one that bounced off the tragus helps the bat place the insect on a vertical scale within an arc of three degrees. So if you think of 90 degrees, right? Three degrees is absolutely tiny. It's extremely precise. So all the bats in Scotland use echolocation to find their prey, but they've all adapted different foraging techniques that complement um, that echolocation. Another incredible adaptation of bats is their sound beams. So all the bats, with all their shapes and sizes, will need to reach this optimal acoustic field of view and they need their sound beams to be as direct and focused as possible. The larger bats with their larger mouths are able to direct their sound beam very narrowly. The smaller bats on the other hand with their smaller mouths have got sound beams which are a lot more spread out. This means they've got to increase their frequency hugely and by increasing the frequency they're able to narrow it down and reach that same optimal acoustic field of view. You might already know of the water bat. Um, this is the Dorbenton's bat. And the way it trolls uh, is it's got these extremely well adapted feet. It's got these really large, hairy feet with loads of stiff bristles, which help it as it's skimming over the water. It will, they will act like rakes. They'll rake up and grasp an insect, while the tail membrane, so that's the bit of skin between the tail and the foot, uh, will scoop up the insect so the bat is able to eat on the wing. So Dorbenton's bat, um, as you can imagine, have a diet of mostly aquatic insects. So like stoneflies, mayflies, caddisflies, pond skaters, but even small fish. They need uh, areas of still water because where there's ripples, uh, they interfere with the bat's echolocation. They also avoid areas with lots of duckweed because again, the duckweed will mask the returning echo and confuse the bat. These are the bats that either fly quite a level flight high above the canopy and then stoop down when they see their prey or they're constantly flying quite erratically uh, along, along habitat edges, along trees, in between gaps. The noctual, the lizeless bats, the pipistrels and the whiskered bat, they all hunt by aerial hawking. So the noctual is our biggest, fastest and noisiest bat. I say biggest, but it actually still fits in the palm of your hand. Fastest, it can fly up to 50 kilometers an hour. And noisiest, it can shout four times louder than the legal limit for a nightclub.
So the nocturne will roost almost exclusively in trees. Its diet is, um, includes moths and beetles and it's not afraid of coming out at night on a full moon. It's quite happy to hunt over open fields uh, and it's also the first bat to come to appear after sunset. It's really so big and so fast it's not scared of predators at all. Now the other uh, side of the aerial hawkers are the pipistrelles. So these are the smallest bats that we have in Scotland. So we've got three species, the soprano, the common and the nathusius pipistrelles. The soprano and the common pipistrelles were actually only separated in 1999, which just shows you how much we've still got to learn about bats. Uh, now the soprano is Scotland's most common, but the common pipistrelle is most common up north, so it's actually the hardiest of all the bats. The pipistrelles are the bats you're most likely to share your house with. The soprano pipistrelle definitely prefers more watery habitats like rivers and lakes and it's quite a specialist feeder so it will pick out insects which have um, a, an aquatic larval stage. Whereas the common is more of a generalist feeder and is quite happy to feed along rivers, in meadows and woodlands, especially deciduous woodlands. Uh, but it's not as picky as a soprano pipistrelle. However, there's been an interesting Scottish study um, that found that the soprano pipistrelles, when they were hunting over water like in rivers, um, were actually calling a lot more as well. So it makes you wonder whether the reason for the common pipistrelle uh, to be more of a generalist feeder is due to their personal choice or whether it's due to competition with a soprano pipistrelle. Now the gleaning um, bat is a natterer's bat. It's not fussy and will eat a wide range of foods including dung beetles, flies, um, harvestmen and spiders, even from their web. So it's able to hunt for insects even on the ground and off branches. So it will just glean them off the branches, a bit like a blue tit. The last of our bats is the brown long-eared bat. This one's different from all the others. It's both a gleaner and a passive listener. It's got these really long ears and a really well-developed tragus to be able to listen to insects fluttering by. Short broad wings as well. So these mean it flies really slowly, about three meters per second, which compare it to the nocturne, which was 50 kilometers an hour, that's 13 meters per second. But the short broad wings means it's got an extremely manoeuvrable flight. Very good for cluttered environments like woodlands. It will feed on moths and flies and on moths specifically, I'll come back to this later, it's extremely well adapted to feed on moths. Because it's got such a slow flight as well, it will emerge later on, about half an hour later than the other bats because it's such an easy prey. And it will also stay and forage about half a, ki a kilometre away from its roost, unlike the nocturne which can travel 10 kilometres away from its roost. The serious advantage of gleaning and passive listening mean that the brown longed bat can still forage outside of the insect peak flight activity and even on cold nights. A fascinating interaction is the one between bats and moths, which is the textbook example of co-evolution or arms race between a predator and a prey. Moths, in response to the bat's echolocating calls, have developed ears. Some moths 
have even developed ultrasonic clicks, which they send back to the bat. One of the theories being is to startle them, and the other is to interfere with the bat's calls. We know that the moth's response is tuned to the acoustic frequencies of the bat calls, so when they hear them, it causes the moths to fly really erratically and very quickly get away from the bat. Now the bat has then responded to the moth developing ears and emitting these calls. Some bats emit calls which are higher or lower in frequencies than the insect's hearing range. Some have started gleaning and picking them off the branches when they're not flying. And others, like the brown long-eared bat, are now passive listening for the moth's flight. These are the bats that will still be able to forage on moths. The rest have just had to change their diet and eat different insects like flies. This coevolution actually explains the evolution of the bats themselves. The oldest bats would have been echolocating and pursuing insects by aerial hawking, and then with the radiation of all the families, such as the ones in the UK, they specialised in gleaning and passive listening. So, you know, how the Dorbentons and the Soprano Pipistrelle are so reliant on those water habitats. The brown long-eared, the natterers and the whiskered bats all need woodlands to hunt in. The noctual, even though it's happy to travel 10 kilometres to feed, um, will only roost in trees. And even the Soprano and common Pipistrelles are quite happy to roost in buildings, but will need those roosting and hibernation sites. All these threats make um, the bats highly in need of all the protection and the conservation action they can get. But what it also means is by being so sensitive, they're an excellent indicator for biodiversity. So uh, you can use them to look at the general health of the environment. Best way of all, really, to learn about bats is to experience them for yourself. Seeing a Dobenton's bat skimming over the water, watching a Pipistrelle flitting about in the trees. What you'll need to get out there to give you a hand is the FSC's guide to bats in the hand and the fantastic chart at the back with all the different bat characteristics for each species. Your best friend will be a bat detector. So with this you'll be able to turn it on and be able to change the frequencies to be able to listen and see the bats for yourself. Lastly, please do check out the Bat Conservation Trust website. They've got a mind-blowing amount of resources on there. And if you feel like it, then join the National Bat Monitoring Programme and join your local bat group for some batty action. Thank you.